network and where you are and uh, the URLs you visit and the subject lines of all the messages that you send and receive and the length and frequency of your messages. So nothing personal or important, right? And I, and I remember we were saying this on the radio and it came just after a, a news story about uh, the Turing centenary. It was about how Alan Turing and his colleagues at Bletchley Park, by cracking Enigma, had logged two years off of, off of the war. And I imagine Theresa May sort of spitballing with Turing and saying, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to get anything useful out of these intercepts. All we're going to know about the enemy is uh, where they are, who they're talking to, <laughs> what the subjects of their messages are, where they go, um, uh, all the people they know, and but nothing valid, right? Because we won't be able to, we won't be looking at the contents of their message. So this isn't anything that that, that would be of any kind of uh, that would that would represent any kind of compromise of anyone's uh, uh, personal information, right? And I kind of imagine Turing leaping up out of the grave to you know cover around the ear for, for <laughs> felony and stupidity in public. Um, so the Snooper Charter is nothing less than an incursion on every corner of our life because our digital life and our lives now overlap almost entirely. Um, companies will be required to gather and maintain specific data sets by, the principal sec by any principal secretary of state, that's uh, most ministers, and then ratified by parliament. Various public bodies will then have access to these data sets. Uh, you'll remember in, in RIPA, the old uh, spying act, said, oh, well, we're just going to gather data about terrorists, and we'll just use it to catch terrorists. And immediately, once the power was made available, um, you had councils using it to find people whose dogs were mucking the pavement. Now, don't get me wrong, I think all those people should be required to wear the poos as a mustache. <laughs> but I think using RIPA to catch people because you think that their dogs have fouled the pavement or because you think that they've maybe faked their address to get their kids into a better school is a total abuse of terrorism powers, and you'd be an idiot to assume that having created an even more expensive set of, of warrantless surveillance powers, that they would be uh, abused any less. Um, you know, this is Chekhov's law. If you put a gun on the mantelpiece in Act 1, it must go off by Act 3. <laughs> um, we call this the Snoopers Charter, but we could just as easily call it the bigger haystack theory. You know, we, there are somewhere in this enormous haystack of all the things that people do. There's the evidence of an infinitesimal amount of terrorist planning. And, and so the theory goes that if we just make the haystack big enough, those needles will start to appear magically. That, that bigger haystacks must have more needles in them. And the sad thing is that bigger haystacks do have more needles in them. They're what statisticians call false positives. That if you, if you gather data as indiscriminately as possible, you start turning up things that look an awful lot like terrorism, even though they're, they're not. They're just people who are statistically odd. You know, as Cardinal Rishi Liu wrote, give me six lines in an honest man's hand and I'll find in them a reason to hang him. It's not new, this idea that if you gather enough intelligence, you'll find uh, uh, false positives in your, in your dragnet. Um, but somehow it seems to have escaped this government's uh, uh, notice. And as we saw with the Levinson inquiry, um, there is no shortage of, of blackable people in government and local authorities and the civil service. That once you start gathering lots of information that an enormous amount of people have access to, what you create is not a thing that allows the police to invade your privacy or government to invade your privacy, but anyone who knows someone in the police to invade your privacy, anyone who knows someone in government, anyone who can arm twist someone or sweet talk someone into letting them gain access will have access to the same data sets as well. Um, and, but this isn't just about letting the police and, and uh, rather, but government just won't have the power to wiretap just one corner of your life, one area that you use. They'll be able to use what they've called filters to build composite profiles of your access across multiple services and to correlate them all together. So really this creates this in the round picture of everything you do. It, it'll it'll uh, correlate your mobile check-ins with your Gmail subject lines, the location data streaming off the apps on your phone and so on. Now in the past, we've made a distinction between public sector surveillance and private sector surveillance. We said, well, it's one thing if the company where you buy books, the bookstore where you buy books, uh, knows what books you bought. Uh, but it's another thing entirely if the government passes a law requiring booksellers to report what everyone's reading. But once you start saying that every business that has a computer to, that keeps its records can be required to retain those records and turn them over without a warrant to the state, what you're really saying is that there's no such thing as, as private sector spying anymore, that everyone in the private sector has become part of the long arm of the law. You've created the public-private partnership from hell. 
where, where the government, go, where, where private uh, companies harvest the data and government gets to reap it. And, and so this is um, uh, about not just, uh, this is mostly about your, your online life, uh, although there's a lot that you do offline that leaves a computer record. And one of the things that we, you'll hear when you campaign on this is that um, if you don't want records of your Gmail being captured, just don't use Gmail. If you don't want your um, uh, mobile life being harvested, just don't have a mobile life, don't use mobile services. As though this is a thing that you just opted into and part of the cost of opting into using these kind of modern gizmos and there's these you know, superfluous services that, that, are, that, that people use because they can't be bothered to have a real life anymore. Um, and if you, don't, if you don't like it, you know, if you don't like the responsibilities that come with the privileges of a mobile life, then you should just opt out. And one of the things that we need to remind people of is that um, the digital and the physical have, have almost completely overlapped and that the internet brings titanic benefits and that asking people or telling people to opt out of the internet has titanic consequences. And this is something we know already from the three strikes work that ORG has done where, you know, as, as part of the, the last parliament's um, uh, digital economy bill, uh, we now ha are heading towards a part of that legislation where you'll be liable to having your internet connection disconnected if you're accused of multiple acts of piracy or if someone you live with is accused of multiple acts of piracy or someone who lives within shouting range of your Wi-Fi access point <laughs> is accused of multiple acts of piracy, you and everyone you live with loses their internet access. And one of the cool ironies of the Digital Economy Act is that it was introduced around the same time as Martha Lane Fox, who's the nation's champion for digital inclusion, uh, introduced her report to Parliament that she commissioned from PricewaterhouseCooper on the value of, of internet access. They, she'd uh, gone to um, uh, post-industrial towns in the north where there had been almost total industrial collapse and a huge number of people living in poverty on council estates. And she found council estates where there had been pilot programs to give people access to the internet and compared them to nearby estates where they hadn't. And she reasoned, I think correctly, that if you compare a place where people have had internet access through no um, uh, action of their own to a group of people living literally next door who haven't and who come from comparable backgrounds that whatever you find that's different in those two groups is likely the result of the internet and what they found is that everything in their lives was improved by access to the internet that not only did they have you know what you think of their kids got better grades or, or, or were more likely to go on to post-secondary education but also that they were more socially mobile that their parents had better jobs and more money and when, when especially very poor people have more money they're nutrition gets better and their health gets better. Um, we know from lots of research that people who have uh, uh, rare diseases or chronic conditions or who suffer terrible injuries greatly benefit from access to network communities of other people living through the same things as do their families. So all of this stuff, um, a better informed populace, better uh, uh, access to nutrition, more likelihood of voting, better civic engagement, um, better access to employment, all of that stuff arrives with the internet. And when you tell people, oh, well, if you don't like being snooped on, just do it in the real world, don't do it in the digital world, what you're really saying is deprive yourself of those benefits that arrive with the internet. Now, the good news is that the Lords in Parliament have been taking public comments on this for, for a committee uh, that will start writing its report at the end of this month, and overwhelmingly, the response has been negative. People don't want this. Anyone who has an opinion on this, the opinion is almost certain to be negative. Um, but the bad news is that the government has a habit of ignoring public comments when it suits them, and this government has given every indication that it plans on making this law no matter what it takes. So this is where you come in and why I'm so glad you've given up your Saturday to be here. We need a nation of campaigners on this issue to kill it the way that we killed the last government's version of this. Um, we need this talked up not just to the people who are nerds like you, but to your neighbors who, who haven't really given it much thought. Remind them of, of hidden cameras and uh, to find people who put out their bins on the wrong day. And imagine what the, com what the, what the comparable version of that is when uh, the hidden cameras are actually digital wiretaps harvesting your entire friend, Facebook friend network or all of your uh, status message update headers or all of the email that you receive. Um, and uh, sign in online petitions, get your neighbors who don't know that they should care about this to sign in online petitions. Go to local meetings and go to your, your, um, your uh, local surgeries, but don't just do that, bring a friend. Bring a friend who didn't know that they were interested in this, bring them along. And while you're talking to your MP, and while you're talking to your local councillor, talk to your friend about it too. Give them, make them part of this live fire exercise and then send them off to do the same thing. 
Um, use they work for you, use their new degrees, use all the tools that have actually made Britain the envy of campaigners around the world as a means of, of contacting government and eliciting responses from them. Most of all, work together. I mean, this is a room full of people who care enough about this to give up their Saturday to, to do something about it. And collectively, we are a lot more creative than any of us could be on our own. We, we have this chance now, because we're in a room together and because a number of you are headed towards the pub, to, to, to form alliances and to set strategies, to save not just our digital lives, but our lives, which are our digital lives. Thank you.